I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jean Marie, and then we'll get right to her talk for today. So, Jean Marie Jackson, I told you. I like you. <laughs> I knew it. Um, is an assistant professor in the English department at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she is and describes herself as an unorthodox comparatist, and in fact, an unorthodox comparatist after my own heart. Her work cuts across Russian, Afrikaans, Shona, and the Anglo Fante literary traditions. Her essays have appeared in venues such as Research in African Literatures, the Journal of Narrative Theory, CLS, uh, the Cambridge Journal of Postcolonial Literary Inquiry, and Novel. Her first book, South African Literature's Russian Soul, Narrative Forms of Global Isolation, was published by Bloomsbury in 2015. And it explored the ways in which the literature and ideas of Russia's 19th century golden age provide a model for thinking South African literature during and after apartheid. This is what I mean by unorthodox comparisons. <laughs> the comparison is sustained by what Jean-Marie identifies as a shared formative sense of isolation in each of these traditions. And its value resides in the ways in which such pairings can serve to displace outdated center periphery models in favor of a more complex thinking of the global in the present. Her next book, the African, Novels of I the African Novel of Ideas, Intellection in the Age of Global Writing, from which her talk today is drawn, stands from Fante anti-colonial statesmanship in the pre-national in pre-national Ghana to mid-century Zimbabwe to South Africa. It's under contract with Princeton University Press, and it's going to appear in the Translation Translation series next year, hopefully 2020. Hopefully in 2020. Um, she also writes for a variety of, let's say, not exactly academic or more <coughs> academic venues, including public books, N Plus One, 3 AM Magazine, and Africa and Words. The most recent issue of N Plus One includes her piece titled On New Zimbabwean Literature, and I just wanted to highlight this most recent publication, both because it's the most recent, and to make one more point about the value of her work, which is that this essay is a review of two books from 2018, Panache to Magadzi's These Bones Will Rise Again, and Mivoyo Rosa Chuma's House of Stone. And the essay, in the process of being a review of two recent books, is also a reflection on the material factors that condition literary production in Zimbabwe and its diasporas. The essay is sensitive to conditions on the ground in a way that informs her readings of the text, rather than allowing the condition, uh, rather than allowing the recording of said conditions to become an end in and of itself. So if the larger picture of her work is one of unconventional comparative pairings, the essay performs in miniature the necessary <coughs> building blocks for such work. The locally engaged and attentive learning about place that makes that kind of larger uh, globally ambitious, let's say, comparison more possible. I look forward to this talk, which I think is the second chapter yes. of the book manuscript. Welcome. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I'm not used to being mic'd up, so I'm feeling shy. <laughs> um, I have made an extremely rudimentary PowerPoint presentation, um, but I do know that the template is suitably fancy with the little boards. Um, so it at least gives you something to look at, um, and it'll give you spellings of some names and things like that. Um, so the title I changed slightly from what I had submitted, so it's now between the House of Stone and the Hard Place, House of Stone being the literal translation of Zimbabwe, Senlake Senkange's turn to philosophy. <clears throat> Imagine, if you would, that you're sitting, not here, but on a hard wooden bench, tired, a bit disoriented, with people speaking passionately around you in three languages. The year is 1960, the date is August 26th, and the country, southern Rhodesia, exists for this crowd at least in name, but not feeling. A wavy-haired white man around 50 years old, gently spoken with perhaps a faint New England, uh, sorry, New Zealand accent, stands up and drops a bombshell that calls everyone suddenly to attention. Quote, the fine Africans who are here with us should not stay away from their people at the present time. <clears throat> As such, he'll be resigning from the state political party whose meeting this is, leaving the rest of you to go on without him, or, as he'd ideally have it, to make the right choice in favor of joining a more radical, though less lovely, his word, organization. Just a month before, after all, things had taken a turn toward violence in the usually sleepy city of Buloeo. What come later to be known as the G riots saw Sunday sermons replaced with flame throwing in the streets as black would-be citizens of an as yet non-existent nation drew a line in the sand and stepped across it to Chimarenga, 
or what now looks like the soft beginning of Zimbabwe's <coughs> liberation war. So the official start date for the war is 64, but things are obviously amping up significantly before then. And G, the name of these riots, is from Kuruayaji, which in Shona means like, it's, it's like to pulverize or smash to smithereens. So it marks a turn towards specifically guerrilla tactics. The white man here is Garfield Todd, Prime Minister of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, present-day Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi, from 1953 to 1958, often referred to as one of the last Rhodesian liberals and the like. He's resigning in our flashback from the just-founded Central Africa Party, CAP, successor to the United Rhodesia Party, URP, which had itself, only five months before, split off from the United Federal Party, UFP. The idea here was to throw his hat in with the more hardline National Democratic Party, NDP, founded that same year, 1960, by the future Zimbabwean struggle legend and Vice President Joshua, Joshua Nkomo, actually the second Vice President. And the NDP is a predecessor to ZAPU, which at various points is both rival and ally of Zimbabwe's ruling party up to the present, ZANU-PF. So if this sounds dizzying, and like you would need a literal flowchart of acronyms to try to keep up with it all, which I do in fact have, it is taped to my desk at work, and there are many more of them. Uh, it is. And there's of course much more to say here on the specifically political front, but my point for today is just to indicate how many and rapidly shifting political affiliations there are in the air in the few decades preceding Zimbabwean independence. In fact, my intention is to resist looking backward from the point of independence at all, as if it had always been a foregone conclusion, instead of a wildly complicated and contingent series of events, leaders, and choices. My purpose in suspending the past from the future is to suggest how an intellectual disposition we might think we know, let's provisionally call it liberal humanist, might offer much that is new looked at in contexts that we know less well, both in terms of how affect relates to history and politics, but also more in my own scholarly wheelhouse of how comportment itself becomes a representational priority. Today I'll be talking then about expressive forms that make a moral claim for how one is over who one is, a deontologized kind of selfhood, at the same time as they look seemingly contradictorily toward cultural restitution. And I had found a clip of um, Garfield Todd speaking at a rally a couple days after this rally, a um, couple of years, sorry. <laughs> that I just thought would be interesting for setting the scene. Here he comes. Some of you might remember him. Um, but there's no sound. Yeah? On here? Oh my god. Next to the clock. Yeah. If they say no to the proposal, they are refusing both his advice and his leadership. <laughs> I believe that the anglo rhodesian proposals are basically unacceptable because they are signed by a Douglas Hume and a Smith, but they are not signed by a Shumba or a Moyo or a Nkong. <laughs> Just a little quick, quick snippet, um, but you can kind of get the, the atmosphere. <laughs> to attempt to come to terms with the representational distinction between prioritizing comportment versus prioritizing something like identity, <coughs> this talk centers not on Garfield Todd, but on another figure sitting quietly in the same room as Todd when he makes his pitch for, ironically, a less multiracial politics. The Shona writer, politician, and educational reformer Senlake Semkange invoked critically almost always as a dyed in the wool nationalist, and usually just in passing, finally speaks that day his disappointment in Todd, his longtime friend and ally's decision to resign from their shared party, the CAP. He, Semkange, still believed in the liberal multiracial CAP, he attests, 
according to his friend, the historian Terence Ranger's archival notes. He declares that he will himself resign within 24 hours to join Joshua Nkomo's NDP, not because he believes in its guerrilla tactics, but because he, Sankange, refuses to be, quote, branded a stooge as Europeans jump ship into a racially bifurcated future. It's a matter of dignity, Sankange states, but he regrets what he calls a very near thing to a white versus black contest, against which he had worked his entire career. Sankange affirms values that might sound almost silly now to an audience versed in decolonial thought. He believes in dignity and multiracialism, as quoted above, and in his fiction and essays, advances the cause of African majority rule by emphasizing due process, nonviolence, and the real clincher, a universal standard of rational argument. To put it simply, Sankange valorizes acting a certain way as a moral end in itself. His belief system is in place, and we might say culturally derived, but it's not contextually dependent. It does not move as politics do. In his tenure as general secretary of the stricken Southern Rhodesian chapter of the African National Congress in the early 1950s, which is actually not very closely related to the ANC that Mandela um, is, is later head of, although it was at one point, as the ANC is torn over whether and how to expand their work from cities into reserves, he favors an almost parodically even-handed patient leadership style. Again, for Ranger's archival records, unlike many of his predecessors in the post, Sanlaki was an energetic social secretary, general, general secretary. What this meant, however, was not Congress activity on the ground, but rather a stream of highly intelligent, sophisticated, and well-researched memoranda to the white minority government about its native policy. Stanlaki took the view that Congress needed to be better informed and that it needed to make more impact on officials by means of the expression of balanced criticism rather than blanket condemnation. As illustration of where this tactic either triumphed or erred, depending, I suppose, still on one's perspective, Ranger notes that Sankange often received long and even reasoned responses from the government. At the time, in a zoomed out way, he has, at the same time, in a zoomed out way, he has plenty of what we would think of as liberationist credibility, both materially and intellectually. He channels money through his personal accounts for ZANU PF at great personal risk, or just ZANU. He's at one point arrested and imprisoned, and as I'll be discussing momentarily as the crux of this talk, He's a seminal figure in the field of Afrocentric philosophy. Looking from the outside in, then, his significance may seem straightforward. <laughs> He's an elite black nationalist of a quickly bygone, kind of stepping stone generation that paves the way for more militant popular action to come. Looked at here, at least imaginatively, from the inside out, his role seems weirder and richer. Just dwell for a moment in this scene a founding father of Southern African cultural nationalism, plays the liberal multiracialist stalwart vis-a-vis -vis his now radicalized white former prime minister. So it's the poignant suspension between a liberal bearing and a radical inertia, I think, that constitutes Sankanya's most provocative contribution to the African literary archive more broadly. What may seem like pretty basic distinctions to us here today, liberal or left, progressive or conservative, grow so relative so quickly during white rule's last gasp in Rhodesia that the real meat of a career like Sankange's is in the disharmony between his bottom line positions as they go down in the books and his moral and affective investments as they're recorded in his <coughs> books. So in moving from the novel to philosophy, just as independence approaches in 1979-1980, Sankange is looking for a way to reconcile his liberal subjectivity, a bent that is for process, fairness, argument, and individual responsibility, these are his descriptions, and the harder line political tactics that he knows are becoming increasingly unavoidable. More specifically, Sankange must try to figure out how to simultaneously express three priorities that don't fit easily together. One, self-abstraction, as demanded by his almost Habermasian rational ideal of the public sphere. Two, the moral significance of individual comportment. 
and three, cultural belonging and pan-Africanist racial advancement. And one of you, veering from a career made on historiography and historical novels, has a PhD in history um, from Indiana, in fact, and toward philosophy might look like an escapist replay of his choice to move to the US in 1966, just as the Civil War in present-day Zimbabwe is really beginning to heat up. Rajita's Unilateral Declaration of Independence, or UDI, when they kind of go full tilt away from the British Empire, happens in 1965. In another, it holds open a proverbial space for values made untenable by the world as it is, charging philosophy with the idealizing work to which Simkange finds the novel no longer suited in his time and place. Before I move on then to a closer look at Simkange's 1980 book of philosophy called Hunduism <coughs> or Ubuntuism, let me try to condense his novelistic career as it anticipates his turn to a more abstract He's probably best known for his 1966 historical novel on trial for my country, in which, in which both the duped and lass and the Bella King Lobengula and the British colonial magnate Cecil or Cecil John Rhodes are given space to testify to their historical transgressions. The demonstration of a fair, unbiased intellect is part of both the form and content of the novel on multiple levels. The trial and the afterlife showcases written correspondence between key historical actors including Lobangula and Queen Victoria. And the book as a whole is presented as a neutrally recounted story that an old man relates to a young Samkange just outside Bulawayo. And in almost every one of his novels, Samkange has a frame narrative in which he says, hey, these are not my words, this is not my thing. I'm just delivering this word for word as I got it from someone else. Lobangula and Rhodes take turns offering dispassionate historical reconstructions with the courtroom setting in the afterlife, allowing them an equal hand in establishing the shared truth of their interactions. So it's easy to see how this book and this alternating technique could be received, could be received in a posed way, and it is kind of a microcosm for some Kanye's career in this sense. On the one hand, as Chenjerai Hof, a very well-known and beloved um, Zimbabwean novelist who died a couple years ago, uh, as Hofe has recalled, it seemed pretty radical at the time to try Rose in 1966. And giving him a chance to defend himself lays his racist duplicity bare. On the other hand, some Kanye to other readers risks seeming sympathetic to pretty much the worst white man there is in this history, offering Rose more space than he deserves, and just maybe suggesting that he and Lobangula are at least roughly comparable in their historical fallibility. Simkange's whole career can be seen as a kind of Rorschach test along these lines. It's been alternately categorized as a liberal colonial apologetics by the German scholar Flora Feigwald, for example, and as a statement of the fallacies of liberalism on the far other end of the political spectrum, as does Terence Ranger. Instead, I maintain that On Trial for My Country sets the tone for a goal that is always a moving target. Deciphering the relationship between what may seem like timeless liberal investments and unavoidably racialized on the ground struggles. Simkanga's writing queries not only to what degree one can insulate core beliefs from their decisive political failures, so does Rhodes betray liberalism or embody it, but what sort of expressive shape, what kind of books you should be writing to be adequate to conveying both investments at the same time. When he moves from a dual protagonist structure in On Trial for My Country, again, Rhodes and Lobangula, to a single protagonist one in a key novel called The Mourned One, which is published in 1975, although it's actually written mostly by 1969, some candy ups the ante here still further. Unlike in the first book, based as it is, as it is on real people, in The Mourned One, some Kange assumes the task of building a single fictional character to carry the full weight of the multi-perspectival, fair observing that he values. As the non-trial for my country, Simkangi begins the mourned one with a transparent frame narrative of having been spontaneously just gifted, gifted with a story. In this case, he claims to happen in 1960 upon a prison memoir by a now deceased young man, wrongly hanged for having raped a white woman. The novel proper picks up where its plot terminates in 1935, which is to say, with white liberal Rhodesia's gross betrayal of the mission-educated African subjects it has cultivated 
And the main school that he's writing about is called Wadala, which is the first um, multiracial, uh, kind of partly uh, based in antiquity in the curriculum, and then introducing more local elements, mission school in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> In different hands, the wrongful conviction of an African man by white authorities might have made for a more obvious, politically galvanizing conclusion of a book meant to disabuse readers of any remaining faith in liberal multiracial education. Instead, for some Conge, it becomes a point of departure. Well, it is all over now, the narrator pronounces. And then a paragraph later, but when the death sentence was actually pronounced, it was shattering and nerve-wracking. I was dazed. My senses became numb. I lost all control of my limbs, power of speech, and everything. It was as if I was having a bad dream and had become petrified. So on the following page, there's a clear and surprising shift from this evoking an experience to analyzing its implications. The supposed prison notebook then reads, and when I woke up, I was refreshed and a man once more. I found my mind clearer than it had been for a long time, and my nerves and mind were strangely relaxed and calm. Such calmness as descends upon a village after an angry whirlwind has swept through. So where the reader is primed for a novel about colonial trauma, she ends up encountering one about victimization as a boon to intellectual distance. Such calm fell upon me. I could think about fate, my fate, about death, my death, about life, the life I would soon lose, as if it were not my own. So the thematic crux of the novel, that is, the betrayal of mission-educated black Zimbabweans by those very white institutions that raised them, is not difficult to uncover. And some Kanye speaker named Bushemwa, or he who was cried for in Shona, Bushema is the verb for to cry, gives it pithy formulation as I was saved to die. As I've just noted, though, this death is only the beginning. I want to offer one passage that reveals the thicker inquiries of the mourned one as they exemplify Sanganya's career just before it tilts to philosophy proper. Wichemwa ponders, can it be that there are other values? Ideas, concepts, traditions, personality, religion, civilization, <coughs> nay, a whole heritage which, perhaps like me, has been saved to die? The mourned one here announces itself not simply as a novel of disillusionment with the liberal values of British missionaries as they are wielded to persecute and literally prosecute African subjects, but as an investigation into whether and by what mechanisms of telling those values may, in part at least, be disimbricated from any individual avatar. I propose then that Samkangi's move toward indigenous philosophy with Munuism or Ubuntuism is in fact a move away from selfhood conceived of as a record of experience and toward a model of selfhood that's bound to a cultural come moral behavioral code. Put differently, a work of cultural philosophy so construed marks an abdication of individuality that can be narrativized as the internalization of history at the same time as it doubles down on the moral significance of individual behavior in a turn toward more systemic kinds of action and thinking. Hunuism, in his and his wife Tommy Samkange's words, um, she's an African-American woman who he marries and they go back to Zimbabwe and she's part of founding his own secondary school, actually. Um, in the Samkange's words, Hunuism comprises the attention one human being gives to another, the kindness, courtesy, consideration, and friendliness and the relationship between people. Elaborating the Shana philosophy, then, allows Samkange to be humanistic without being bellatristic, attuned to the fine points of individual conduct without hazarding to portray a representative individual. So, as to the book itself, the Sumkangis began Munuism or Ubuntuism by enjoining fellow Zimbabwean intellectuals. It is our business to distill this philosophy and set it out for the whole world to see. But they add, it is not our claim that everything Africans evolved under Munuism or Ubuntuism is superior to anything evolved elsewhere, and insist we must develop perspicacity to discern what must be preserved and what must be eschewed in both Hinduism and Western culture. The we here is, of course, specifically the majority that will soon rule Zimbabwe, but also extends by design to a wider theoretical readership. The book's authorship, in the sense that it's Zimbabwean and American, and its title, it translates between Shona and Endebele and Zulu, are transcultural and transnational. 
The book's first chapter then explicitly notes that there is a sense in which we are all Africans, black, white, and brown. The relevant point here is that the work is set up to facilitate movement from immediate context to a broader public, with the preface stating its intention to put forth the wisdom of centuries as it will stand the test of time and space. In effect, it offers guidelines for its own reading as a means of connecting Zimbabwe's moment of independence to a universally replicable way of being, demanding the compromised individual action of setting and character that a realist novel set in Rhodesia would have to. It does not demand these things, right? It can sort of be lifted, of, uh, lifted above realism, um, lifted above history in some way, at the same time as it remains bound to um, Zimbabwe, and not just history, but cartography. The book actually has a number of maps at the beginning. <laughs> so the Simkongis begin the book's first non-introductory chapter with a vivid yet vast description of its privileged locale. Between the waters of the mighty Zambezi in the north and the languid Mpopo River in the south lies a land which is bounded in the east by the coastal waters of the Indian Ocean. Zimbabwe in this way lays claim to epic grandeur and an unusual degree of situatedness, at least as far as philosophy is concerned, at the same time. A complementarity made still clearer in the next paragraph's parallel between the date of its first habitation and the birth of Christ. It is a magisterial evolving space the Simkangis walked the reader through the when Mutapa and Rotary empires had once occupied it, and into its agricultural advancement through the 19th century, whose present racial geography is but a blip on the civilizational radar. If Zimbabwe is thus established as an indisputably fertile cultural landscape best viewed on a scale of what we now call deep time, it's also one whose intellectual contributions require an unusual amount of context and filling in to be brought to full fruition. Simkange thus experientializes philosophy, even as he opts for philosophy over a more experiential kind of narrative at this point in his career, demanding that the reader work to extract an intellectual modality from a real place. I think there's a broader lesson here for what African and Africanist methodologies can offer comparative literature, but especially global anglophone um, and sort of surrounding fields now. So with my quick introduction to On Trial for My Country and the Moore one fresh in mind, it's as if Stenlake Simkange has made his way from the historical novel genre, with its characters granted by life, through a more abstracted, fictionalized avatar that is a combination of autobiography and historical distillation, and here has arrived finally at a fully de-individualized mode of exposition. And yet this is not at all the same thing as a disembodied one in the sense that customary behavior in Zimbabwe remains essential to the norms of comportment now being universalized through their written account. Hoodooism or Ubuntuism is, therefore, a philosophy that is the experience of 35,000 years of living in Africa, the Simkange is right. It is a philosophy that sets a premium on human relations in a world increasingly dominated by machines and with personal relationships becoming ever more mechanical Africa's major contribution in the world today may well make her sense of Hunu or Ubuntu, which her people have developed over centuries. Only on the following page does Danaki offer an account of Hunuism in the flesh, recalling an episode in the early 1950s when two young Shona men refused payment for getting his car stuck out of the ditch. Their refusal, a local elder reminds them, should be dictated by a distant family or what some Kange calls tribal relation on account of which accepting compensation or would not be humanness. The ordering of elements here is significant. <coughs> Sankangi begins with an implication and then summons the example. Philosophy thus performs, or more aptly, is defined as a generalizing function that is distinct from the cultural codes it observes. So those of you who have some background in African studies um, and are familiar with the debates around ethno-philosophy that start happening really in the 1980s. Um, this is Mudinde's big critique of Afro-originating philosophy, is that it's not commentary-based, it doesn't have that kind of reflexive level. And in many ways, Simkange um, anticipates that problem and has already resolved it, I think, in 1980. Instead of seeing cultural restitution then as an antidote to first principles, the Simkange sees Zimbabwean codes of conduct as intrinsically valuable and ripe for replicability. Hunuism or Ubuntuism 
is intrinsic, uh, particularizes in the name of hard-won generalization, a pre-existing language of experience, so we act for this way and this reason, the elder says you don't accept payment, and so you don't, is grafted to a language about it. Here is why this way of doing things matters, in an ultimate sense. The brand of philosophizing alongside heavily anecdotal description encourages a view of individuality that is a matter of how, rather than who, or even what, one is. And so the Simkangis find an ideal of intellectual comportment through Shona culture, and pinpoint Shona culture through its ideal of comportment, which is called Sika, or sort of culturedness. But they do not concoct a representative figure for either, which in kind of the literature and philosophy realm, right, philosophical novels, is quite rare. There's no Socrates here self-reflexively conversing as the fleshly embodiment of his epic. No Shona man who teaches, but instead gentle observation of what there is to learn. In conclusion, then, the expiration of Stenlake Simkangi's type, which is very recognizable at a certain point in African liberation history, erudite, measured, committed to democratic means as much as restitutive ends, and a familiar facet of anti-colonial work, also in Ghana, for example, um, which my book takes up, may now seem like an inevitable fact of a history of struggle. His career, to be sure, offers moments like his long, painstaking letters to Rhodesian authorities that may seem downright deluded. At the same time, his writing also offers an abiding and textured reckoning with what it means to value something like fair-mindedness and more broadly, individual comportment at all in a context where, in some ways, it really doesn't matter in any practical or political sense. In this, in the gap between historical bottom lines and a commitment to individual behavior, then Sankange still has much to say. Thank you. that talk. I'm going to open up the floor so that other people can ask questions. We have about 20 minutes, so this is perfect. Rose. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to confine myself to I was thinking of you and Tambi. I thought oh, they're going to recognize our film talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, most people don't know. Yeah. <coughs> the first is, you know, Terence Ranger is so crucial to so much of what's going on right now. Yeah. And I noticed that at one point you sort of cite him in order um, to kind of illustrate the history of your subject um, sometime. And then at another point, you disregard him as having, um, you know, a reading of some kind of that you, you know, that you feel is too far one way as opposed to a, a liberal reading. And so I'm just wondering method methodologically what you're doing because you know, Terence is so crucial yeah. to, you know, everybody from Yvonne Vieira right the way back um, to some kind of Then the second question is, and I know you're doing a comparative study, but I haven't read it, so yeah. this is where the question is coming from. To what degree, I mean, at what point does this Ubuntu intersect with nationalism in the sense that this book is coming at a very specific period in the history of African humanism? I mean, Impatriate is already out there, mm -hmm. you know, all the other big boys are out there mm -hmm. doing the African humanism, but, and Ubuntu clearly exceeds, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about the kind of Desmond Tutu version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it clearly, <laughs> it, it, I don't know that it's operating any differently in rural Zulu Yeah. Right? So I'm a little, I just have this question about what it means to harness Ubuntu. Um, via a notion of tribalism yeah. into the unit of the nation. Yeah, yeah, those are wonderful questions. Thank you. Um, the issue of Terence Ranger, <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who, who don't work um, so much in this field, Terence Ranger is a historian, and for a long time he was sort of the uh, anti-colonial but British historian of what becomes Zimbabwe. Um, and he has almost complete control over a lot of the archive because he's deeply embedded in, in what's happening there. Um, so there's a book called um, Are We Not Also Men? And it's primarily a biography of Stanlaki Santangi's father, his name is Thompson Santangi, who is a major figure in the history of Southern African Methodism. Um, and he's very, very well known as um, a sermonist in his own right. 
Um, he's, he's quite a fearsome intellectual. He also tries to be involved in administering a, a secondary school that kind of goes amiss. And so Terence Rainer's reading of the Mourn one, for example, that it's actually heavily autobiographical, but then at a second level of removed biographical of some kind of his dad. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. I think the problem with some of those sources is that it, you're, you're, there's no distance whatsoever. I mean, that book is completely drawn from his access to the Sinkange family archive, sitting in their house, going through their closets, because he and Salaki are very close friends for many years. Um, and so as source material, it's completely essential. Um, you can't get these sources. They are, to, what I understand is that most of them are still in the Sinkange family home in Mujara, but I, I, I'm not sure that they're all there. Um, they're not sort of officially archived in Zimbabwe, as far as I'm aware. Bits and pieces made their way out, but he's really got a kind of monopoly on a lot of these sources. So he's just quoting voluminously um, from them by the end of that book. It's not very heavily edited, and it's extremely useful. Um, that said, Terence Rainer is not a literary critic in a lot of ways, right? And it's not sort of pulling rank or something like that. Um, but precisely in his closeness to these people and the situation, and sort of bringing a lot of it into a broad scholarly purview, he does a huge amount of activism and getting the, the work and um, the, these names out there. I, I think the works end up expiring faster than they should, precisely in that reading. You know, that everything ends up kind of getting amassed into this patriotic history. Uh, paradigm, and they're more interesting than that in, in some ways. At the very least, they've got other elements to them. Um, so Ranger's kind of one of those, w w work with him, and obviously you, you need all these quotes and the material, but I try not to be limited to his model, particularly because he revises it himself so much um, as he goes on through his oh, career. I mean, not enough, man. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, really, yeah, so, so grateful and then slight arm's length. And I think it was much harder for you know friends of mine who work in, of course, the Latin Academy, where coming into Zimbabwean studies almost completely threw him. And <laughs> in, in, in some ways, um, there it's more difficult to get that slight arm's length. Um, and the second question, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in relation to Kashlele, but but for sure he was reading it. And they're obviously both in the states um, at the same time. So Kanye is at Harvard for a while before he comes back to Zimbabwe. Um, I, I'm not sure they interacted. I was in the Heinemann archive a couple of years ago <coughs> reading some Kange's letters from Harvard and a lot of correspondence with Doris Lessing and this really weird kind of sweet friendship <laughs> that the two of them had. Um, nothing with Nepashale as far as I recall. Right, but, but I, just, I don't think I require, I mean, I'm not asking you. You mean the roar, what's in the air at that point? I, mean, yeah. I don't think yeah. I can speak about Ubuntu at this yeah. particular stage in 1980 yeah. as though some kind of invasion. Yeah. This, well, some kind of, so first of all, he bases Nyatsima College on the Tuskegee Institute. Yeah. And he's very, he's enchanted with Booker T. Washington, yeah. who, in thinking about Blacks of an African history, is um, a figure that's often just completely yeah. left out because you know people read from Marcus mm -hmm. Garvey. Um, for sure, and then there's a the kind of connection with West African pan-Africanisms, but actually Booker T. Washington is in a lot of ways a bigger influence. And so he has a kind of Afro-centricizing uh, agenda that is partly inspired by his time in the States um, and by his marriage to, to Tommy. Um, but then I think when he comes home, it's a way of fitting back in maybe with some of the energies connecting him across new Southern African borders. Um, but he stops at a certain point of his nationalism very clearly. I mean, he sort of draws a line in the sand and will not be part of ZANU-PF after he, he comes to blows with a couple of its new figures. So he really anticipates in a lot of ways ZANU going, going down, the, <laughs> down the drain um, politically. And he's not popular for it at, at that point. Um, so I think that it's being marshaled in a more, inte more intellectual way, if you will, um, and is not necessarily being marshaled to have to have some sort of affinity with, with the state, um, which a lot of his peers are doing. Um, I mean, you know, at, at that point, obviously he's not a veteran, so he's already sort of out of... I, I guess I was just questioning the extent to which it's Zimbabwean indigenous as opposed yeah. to sub-Saharan. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> he doesn't get into... I mean, he narrates Nzilikazi and Lopakula a lot, yeah. but aside from that, he doesn't do much with... It, it's more a name than anything else. I think it's just not to make it seem like the wrong kind of nationalism. Okay. Um, you know, thank you so much. I should uh, monopolize so much. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the 
the different publication venues of the, the novels and, and this book and, and the kind of implications for the kind of audiences that he's maybe speaking to or trying to speak to or, or ends up speaking to. So these are the AWS mm -hmm. groups, kind of, uh, uh, see, a, an international audience. Mm -hmm. And then the, the philosophy book, I, didn't, I couldn't quite read who, who <coughs> published that. Philosophy book is originally, I believe, Mambo. Okay. Um, I have to check up on that, but it goes out of print a bunch of times and then comes comes back. Actually, I'm hoping that it will come. We're working on kind of getting it in a new edition. I anyway, mean, that's neither here nor there. Right. So yeah. So so for the kind of audiences in, involved in reading this compared to who's reading the novel and, yeah. and kind of how these ideas were received or, or circulated in, in comparison with his novels. Yeah, I um, mean, for a long time he's the only Rhodesian writer published in the AWS, and he's extremely proud of this. There's an anecdote where he refused to go to one of the early, I'm not sure whether it was the first, but Zimbabwe book fairs. <laughs> he said, I've published 11 books. Like, what, you think I'm going to stand up there and talk with people who, like, you know, <laughs> wrote a single unpublished poem, and he gets very haughty about it. Um, but I, I, mean, I, I, I don't have data on it, you know, so I mean, it's hard to, to speculate. Certainly he's being read by academics in the States because of his time in Indiana um, and then at Harvard and at Fisk. Um, so he has sort of a kind of elite American audience interested in Afrocentrism and through his marriage, I think, comes into more of that. And he has an academic audience, for sure, in Zimbabwe to this day. And these are the editions, the, the AWS still circulating in Zimbabwe. They haven't been reprinted. Um, so, to the extent that he travels, you know, through uh, the, the kind of broader Anglophone audience, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure how it, kind of, if you're looking for a, 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 a quantitative sense. No, no. Yeah. No, I'm just, yeah. Well, I guess I'm interested in whether, but the, this move to philosophy it means yeah. a different kind of audience. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, my sense, and it's provisional. <laughs> sense, it's provisional. Is no. Okay. No. Um, I think by that point he has his audience pretty well locked in. Um, and the book goes on to be sort of the, the gospel for thinking about um, Hunduism in Zimbabwean scholarship. And it's cited in every essay, even in today, sort of that lets his work, something coming out of UJ and people working on Ubuntu. Some Kanga is often cited as a seminal text for kind of actual philosophy text, as opposed to, I mean, the sort of broader humanistic movement that's happening in literature. Is that so? I mean, so so I, I I think probably if you've read if you've read past on trial for my country and origins of Rhodesia, then I think you end up reading most of the rest. That, that would be my my sense of it. Yeah. I'm I'm a little confused in how you're using this how you're using the term Afrocentrism, okay? Because um, his writing predates what would be considered Afrocentrism, so I'm just wondering how what in what way is this considered? you know, kind of Afrocentrism. As a it's U.S. A, movement? Um, yeah. That's, Africa-centric is his, his description of his... African-centric. Yeah. So, but African-centric isn't Afrocentrism. You know, that's, so I'm just kind of, because it's, because people use African-centric, and, but it's not the same thing. You or, know? And, or, I mean, yeah, Atosetio too uses Afrocentric with the I. I mean, I, it, 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 in a U.S. context, I mean, it has no... I would, say this. I would be I would be very wary of you because Afrocentric when you when you translate it into Afrocentric it has a very specific connotation here, and a very specific timeline, and a very specific ideation, you know, and very specific scholars and very specific movement, and re people have all have always you know they use Afrocentric Af you know like African centered and it's usually in terms of Pan Africanism more so than Afrocentrism. So yeah, mm -hmm. and he, I would say he, he self-describes using a sort of panoply of terms, but mm -hmm. certainly they could be termed up. I mean, I, it, the U.S. Afrocentric literature, I, I don't know terribly well. So, mm -hmm. but th thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question, which is essentially an invitation for you to speak about the larger project. Um, so that this is what the question is, but I'll say some more things. Um, I'm curious about the description of this kind of type and the disappearance of a type in the kind of after the moment of nominal decolonization that he, that Chimakin's representative, there, there are others like him. 
mm -hmm. right, that cease to, for various reasons in different contexts, either exist quite literally because they end up assassinated or um, kind of end up withdrawing in different ways and articulating different uh, sorts of philosophical, political, or aesthetic projects as a kind of response to that. And I'm wondering, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm thinking of your popular piece and maybe its relationship to what you're writing about yeah. in the Ghana chapter, yeah. but the extent to which a project on the novel and philosophy ends up being also a project on this type. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, 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 the first half of it, yeah, sure. I mean, in the Zimbabwean context, the most famous is Herbert Chitekel, mm -hmm. um, who's assassinated, and, you know, there, there's still sort of, um, among Zimbabwean writers, just speculation, even kind of long-form Facebook narrative and such, on if Chitekel had lived, how would ZNPF ultimately have looked different, um, and who knows. But the the prototype is really um, in the book, J. E. K. Sully Hafer, in some ways, who is a fancy elder statesman, um, also very involved in setting up secondary institutions of higher education in Ghana. Um, and the inspiration for it is really kind of anecdotal, and it won't be in the book, obviously, but at a talk it seems more fair game, um, which is that I kind of inherited my father -in -law, late father-in-law's archive. Um, he was uh, in Kwame Nkrumah's cabinet and was also a sort of funky statesman and, and economic scholar and has voluminous writing I means sort of the Karen Barber line with that generation, you know, 50s and 60s of suitcases of, of documents under their bed. Um, and people didn't really know what to do with it. It was like, oh, here, here are these books. And so they, they seem interesting, have fun. Um, and I was continually struck by how his habits, which were kind of meticulously recorded and a lot of diarizing, and this generation, again, I'm thinking, you know, 50s and 60s, really 40s through through 60s, um, was so solitary, you know, and, and sort of needing hours every single day to retreat from the work of state building and institution building, and um, you know, library collecting and obsessive attention to somehow finding balance between a Western canon and a Fanti speaking household, in this case. And I thought, well, coming out of um, I mean, I have a comparative literature background, but really in African studies, I didn't have any readily available language to think about the ways in which a lot of the affective investments um, were sort of, seemed disharmonious with, or were at least surprising, considering that he's this, you know, kind of real life, flesh and blood, um, anti-colonial state builder. And I thought, well, that, that's a problem, probably, for thinking about how literature and the expressive arts develop, because we end up starting with the middle of the century as, and you hear this critique a lot now in African literature, but as the beginning, rather than as some kind of turning point or even a culmination of earlier generations of, um, of anti-colonial workers and, and writers. Um, so this chapter connects very much to the chapter on J.K. Sleekhafer in a novel called Ethiopia Unbound, um, which is the first chapter of the book. It doesn't draw a direct line, although actually some Kange does reference a few times the Aborigines Rights Protection Society which is a sort of West African and kind of moving between London and West African um, group for what it sounds like, African rights um, at the turn of the, the 20th century. But they kind of occupy similar points in their own national timelines. Um, so one of the book's ambitions is to find some kind of compromise, I guess, between projects that are fully nation-based in African literary studies, of which you have a lot of very good examples, and a methodology that for me is much more of a problem, which is a sort of scattershot, um, you, you know, kind of gra grabbing books from wherever in this more global anglophone field and kind of totally extracting them from an original context of meaning. And so the book proceeds by what I'm calling a kind of staggered timelines. Where is Zimbabwe in 1980 identical to Ghana in 1957? By no means. Um, but there are also crucial points of culpability at least, and enough mutual reference or like that reference, you know, kind of Zimbabwe to Ghana, that you can build something there. So it's trying to do justice to each chapter in a way that sort of moves something forward as a more continuous chronology. Um, and I think it's, it's very hard, you know, working on the continent because you don't want to feed into a kind of nationalist methodology, but at the same time, how do you do something synthetic while acknowledging that there's no way to be responsibly comprehensive. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. 
I was wondering, you emphasize a lot the investment in the liberal notions of, of selfhood, individual responsibility and all this stuff. I'm wondering if you're finding in his work anything that goes, without making a hierarchy, which you say that he's not doing, are you finding other ways of constituting the self in his work in terms of the community and constituting the self as a part of a collective mm -hmm. in relationship to other humans, non-humans, land, other ideas that don't fall into uh, liberal mm -hmm. subjectivity, mm -hmm. and what, what are they doing? There? Absolutely, I mean, that's what kind of philosophy is where he ends up um, in attempting to do that, sort of, if enough individuals behave in this way in relation to one another, then you sort of arrive at a, a collective, I guess. Um, but it's all displaced historically, it's all looking way back. So the problem here with, into, with it in the Mourned One, and this the chapter gets into this a lot, um, is that he has a main character who has, um, within the book, unique access to two different environments. So he has access to his village through a twin brother who's kind of left behind, and that's a trope of African writing in this period you see a lot. Um, there's another novel by Charles Mungoshi, where it's the same thing, kind of one brother leaves for uh, you know, a colonial center of education, one brother stays behind, and the moral rift. Um, that, that sort of thing. But he, he learns about his village, and there are things that he thinks are wonderful about it. He talks about having feelings of freedom and ecstasy going back, um, and there are also things that he really dislikes about it. Um, so he actually was supposed to be killed as a baby, this character, because um, in his Zizuru Shona um, custom, where he was from, if you are a twin, you get put in a pot, in a river, and the pot gets closed, and, and you suffocate. So he was supposed to die. Um, so the fact that he was saved to die is actually not only a reference to sort of you know saved by this white-led multiracial Rhodesian institution. He also was saved to die by Shonas. Um, and so he's not able to fully embrace a kind of communal uh, self-becoming because he sees a huge amount of problems with where he's from, frankly. Um, and there are also problems, um, again, sort of notable, I think, even though the book is written in the mid to late 1960s, he's commenting on sexual violence and attitudes um, against women in his village. So then he leaves, goes back to the Wadala institution, um, which is this famous sort of uh, liberal multiracial Methodist debate societies. It's also an institution that he shared with J.E.K. Slade in Ghana. Um, Methodism is extremely influential for the kind of intelligentsia class in both places, in both countries. Ghana and, and Zimbabwe, um, and he's disenchanted with that. And so he wants to take bits and pieces, both from what he divides into sort of a communal life, right, and a liberal education, which is not unusual um, for, I think, uh, an African writer published in the AWS at this point. But what is interesting about him is that he kind of comes to a point where he pushes the novel form for himself as far as it can go in accommodating that both end. So he's trying to give the character who has access to two worlds, and most of the characters don't, an omniscient perspective. So he's actually able to narrate thoughts that people have surrounding him when he's a baby, and he's meant to die. Um, but precisely in that capacity for omniscience, um, you know, to model some kind of authority um, that on some level perhaps some Kongi has been trained to think that an elder statesman going into the new Zimbabwe should have, should be able to manifest it, it, it strains the representational techniques that he's got available to him. Because he does end up dying, right? And so if he, he, he can't make it in one or the other, sort of communal or individual. And so rather than trying to fuse those things in the form of a novel, which happens much more commonly around him, so there's a novel that comes up also in, I believe it's 1980, um, might be 79, called The Non-Believer's Journey by Stanley Young but it's much more about that. He thinks he's like this individual, he's not gonna be a veteran, you know, he doesn't fight. And then he gets in a fight at the end of the book, and he comes around to realizing, okay, I've got to get some kind of national consciousness um, going on. So somehow he moves completely to a different way of, of giving account to this moment. Right? Philosophy is able to do things for him um, in terms of reconciling the idea of liberal comportment and a communitarian sense of self that the novel is not. How does this work with ideas about, I mean, there's a philosophy of dying, right? There's a way of dying where you become a part of the ancestors, right? And uh, the, so how yeah. does, I'm just curious yeah. because I haven't read it. How yeah. does he relate to that? Not, not doesn't much. 
Um, it, 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 it's, it's much more about, um, so the book, um, and again, in a chapter we'll get into this, I'm happy to, to send it to you, I know you're working on, on Zimbabwe. Um, it's much more about policy recommendations, actually, in the present, so the philosophy gets used to make actual recommendations for how he thinks ZANU should govern. Um, so there is a point where he comes up with a tripartite model of property. So there is individual property ownership, there is state property ownership, and there's collective property ownership. And he says, ultimately, a fully communal sense of being is not, in fact, true to Shona customs of property ownership, but that's a sort of essentialism of it. Um, but nor is the idea only of having individual property ownership. So actually, to be, to be true to our roots in some ways, we need to have a modified, what I guess Kwame Jeji would call like a modified communitarianism. Um, his recommendations are not taken, <laughs> if, if you're wondering, but he actually does structure, especially the second half of the book, as a set of policy ideas, yeah. So, um, I'm, I de well, I definitely see the relationship, Ethiopian bound in this, you know, kind of the philosophical undergirding of both texts. Yeah. And I'm wondering about the other chapters, are they similar with that kind of philosophical undergirding that you have in, with each author, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Yo, so, so, it, it, so there, there are four chapters, so mm -hmm. um, the book is divided into two halves, and there's kind of a deliberately missing middle that mm -hmm. is accounted for in the introduction. So mm -hmm. the moment of, you know, flourishing of African literature as an institution, usually dated, of course, to Achebe and Shoyika and the 50s and 60s. Um, those big novels are, are not in it. So the book makes a more dramatic demarcation between books in which philosophy is, is fully instrumentalized um, as precisely a way of allowing individual agents, I won't say selves, because it's never, you know, in Ethiopian bound, too, it's, 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 it's not psychic, right? There's no interiority to Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. um, but individual agents in the narrative wield ideas in a way that, that formally kind of pushes the narrative along. Ideas actually have power um, mm -hmm. in a narratological sense. And the second two chapters are about more recent books, sort of textual groupings by geography and formal design, um, one in Eastern Africa and one in Southern Africa, again, where you have a similar kind of highly reflective Self, figures who are self-consciously engaging in abstraction. Um, so not just, uh, you know, what sometimes you know, narrative theorists call oscillation mm -hmm. as a model of ideas, but not that kind of psychic brand, but actually saying, here I am in the social world, I will depart from it momentarily to broach the abstract. Um, but in a way that becomes um, formally uh, immobilized. It happens, but it doesn't really do anything. These characters are often outcasts. Um, either completely so, in one case is a Burundian novel where the, philo the kind of philosopher character is actually mute, um, and one case uh, is in a kind of ostracized albino character, um, academics who are completely made fun of, um, I mean, not given any real heft in bringing something resembling a social collective together. So the book in large part kind of asks what, what happens, you know, well, what happens to philosophy as something that is forced in, in novels and potentially force in the world um, by extension that that's a very hard thing to pull off now. I'm, I'm kind of interested with, with Ethiopian, but how are you bridging that gap with kind of like that psalmist undertext? Yeah. You yeah. know, the, yeah. you know, like, you know, Ethiopia shall, shall you yeah. know, stretch her hand out to God kind of yeah. subtext that's in there, you know? You mean, I mean, uh, yeah. one thing I think I probably, so <laughs> I'm working on a I'm sorry, that's too particular. I'm sorry for the room. No, no, I know it. It's fine. So I'm working on a third book right now, mm -hmm. which is actually all on G.K. Sengifer. Ah, okay. Um, it's called An Experimental Biography. Ah, and okay. It, it gets into that more and the mm -hmm. way that it combines Methodism with Fanti mm -hmm. um, cosmology. Mm -hmm. So in this book, it's it's not there so much. I mean, it's accounted mm -hmm. for as part of this larger, you know, kind of panoply of, of forms and snippets and all that. But the third book is a sort of, it's meant to be a history of a sensibility, that's what I'm calling it, at a very early mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of looks at his institutional histories as well. So um, Mfantipim School, Furame in Sierra Leone, all the way to the Achimoto School mm -hmm. in Accra, and how religious education gets refigured in a way that does speak directly back to Ethiopia. And so so it, it, I address that, but not, not so much in this project. Thank you. Okay. Well, we are uh, 
just past time. Uh, so thank you. Very much.